This is a remarkable newsreel from Belfast from 1920. Between 1920 and 1922, Belfast is the most violent place in Ireland. It's really the epicenter of revolutionary violence. What we see again and again is violence in one part of Ireland leads to violence in another part. The cost of that violence is it made the connections between North and South um, so much more difficult. On the 22nd of June, 1921, King George V and Queen Mary arrived in Belfast for the official opening of the first Northern Ireland Parliament. Fearful for their lives, they had come to a city scarred by bitter sectarian division. Those deep-rooted fissures and differences become particularly potent and particularly magnified from the summer of 1920 onwards. The King's visit to Belfast was the culmination of several centuries of history and three years of political brinkmanship and brutal communal violence. The underlying aim of the King's visit to Belfast was to emphasize reconciliation between Britain and Ireland, between Irish people, north and south, and to create the conditions for negotiations to open up, whether that would be between north and south or between Britain and Ireland, to reach a final settlement. The occasion marked the creation of the new state of Northern Ireland. We're looking at film of the first sitting of the Northern Ireland Parliament. It is, of course, a highly symbolic occasion. The show is now on the road. A line had been drawn on the map, a new border that separated the north and the south of the island. Borders caused difficulties. Probably 50,000 Catholics leave the north. Many thousands of Protestants leave the south. But of course, the real border was always in people's minds. And that is the problem that we are always grappling with. This is the story of the dramatic events that led to the partition of Ireland. A story that continues to reverberate to the present day and dominate relationships between the islands of Britain and Ireland. The history of this period is incredibly difficult, causing people to lose lives and for some people to lose faith in the states that they have been put in. Um, so we should never forget that aspect of this history. In November 1918, the Great War came to an end. But as people rejoiced, the full cost of four long and bloody years was about to become clear. By the end of the First World War, Britain was broke. It was facing a recession, which would come into force pretty soon. And also, there was international questions, such as self-determination. Britain had gone to war for small nationalities, and now it's coming home to roost. The man faced with leading Britain into this post-war world was the Liberal Prime Minister in a new coalition government, David Lloyd George. Lloyd George was the Welsh wizard. He was the great political genius of his time. And in 1918, Lloyd George, having won the war, now had to face what Clemenceau, the French uh, Prime Minister, said was a more difficult task of winning the peace. The first thing to say about Lloyd George is that he was extremely pragmatic. He wanted to get things done. But in the coalition government, he had always constantly to be looking over his shoulder at his Conservative colleagues and the idea that they might be plotting to, move, to, to remove him. The war had changed not only Britain, but also the landscape of Europe. And as emerging states asserted their national identities, the impact was felt across the British Empire. The British Empire was really transformed by the effect of the First World War. The Indian population contributed a lot to the British war effort. So too have the, um, the so-called white dominions, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa. They all expect to get something out of this conflict. Empires were no longer the normative political form in the world. 
the German Empire was gone, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was gone, the Russian Empire was gone, and the Ottoman Empire was gone. You had the emergence of nation states out of these collapsed empires, and the nation state suddenly became the normative political form. For Britain, the loudest and most strident demands for self-determination came from very close to home, from a country that it had ruled for centuries, Ireland. Prior to the war, and in response to long-standing demands from Irish nationalists, Britain had been preparing to devolve some powers to a Dublin-based parliament through so-called home rule. But home rule was fiercely resisted by unionists, particularly in Belfast and large parts of Ulster, where for centuries the population had been impacted by migration from Scotland and England. Ulster as a province developed in a very different way because of what was essentially a massive project of social engineering in the 17th century. What we call the plantations, Scottish settlers, English settlers, who bring to the province of Ulster a completely different identity. By the end of the 19th century, Ulster's distinctiveness was marked by its status as the most industrialized part of Ireland. Belfast and its hinterland enjoy uh, an enormous demographic as well as industrial expansion in the 19th century. And this is unprecedented in terms of the wider island of Ireland. And it links Belfast and its backdrop, its hinterland, I think much more directly into uh, a British industrial landscape. From shipyard workers to wealthy industrialists, Ulster Unionists' resistance to home rule was driven by their fear of a Dublin-based, Catholic-dominated parliament and its impact on their ties to Britain and the Empire. As soon as the 1912 Home Rule Bill is passed, the issue of what is to be done with the resistant North East comes into play. They have formed the Ulster Volunteer Force. They've signed a covenant that they will not accept government from Dublin. While maintaining their loyalty to king and country, Ulster Unionists were in fact prepared to take up arms against the British government to defeat home rule. If the British government is agreeing to the imposition of home rule for the whole of the island, how do you deal with Ulster opposition? And Unionists threaten that they will use any means at their disposal or any means necessary uh, in order to prevent Home Rule uh, being imposed. And that inevitably focuses minds on the idea of a possible exclusion of Ulster or parts of Ulster from Home Rule. The outbreak of the First World War averted the threat of a violent confrontation between Ulster Unionists and the British government, and Home Rule was suspended but the Irish political landscape was about to change forever. As war raged on the Western Front, in Dublin and across Ireland, a radical nationalist movement emerged. Unlike the Irish Parliamentary Party, whose MP sat in Westminster and had campaigned for home rule within the empire, the new movement demanded complete separation from Britain. To that end, at Easter 1916, armed rebels seized buildings in Dublin city centre and declared an independent Irish Republic. The Easter Rising really changes political thinking. For the first time, we have republicanism emerging as the sort of a, the, the agreed political movement of Irish nationalists. That's a much more kind of radical vision. It's much more uh, akin to the idea of a separate state with no links to Britain. The rebellion was quickly suppressed, but the execution of 16 of its leaders provoked widespread revulsion and popular support for their goal of Irish independence. The 1916 Rising changed the climate of opinion radically. For a younger generation, they have been transformed 
by a new language, which is for an independent Ireland, the language of the Republic that's been declared in 1916. And what home rule was seems to them a kind of dream of yesterday that in any case was never going to be fulfilled. Their demands have gone far beyond that. Nine weeks after the Easter Rising, on the Western Front, the men of the 36th Ulster Division made a very different blood sacrifice. In July, during the first two days of fighting at the Battle of the Somme, the division suffered an appalling 5,500 casualties, men fighting for Britain and the Empire. Ulster and Ulster Unionists have made extraordinary sacrifices. The Battle of the Somme was absolute slaughter. Particularly for Ulster Unionists, they regarded that sacrifice during the war as almost a blood down payment on a future settlement that would secure their part of the United Kingdom. By the end of World War I, there has been a sea change in Ireland put into motion by the 1916 Easter Rising in Dublin. Everything has changed except the British governing mind, which takes a very long time to catch up. In the aftermath of the Easter Rising, support for the Republican Party Sinn Féin, meaning ourselves alone, had increased significantly. Formed in 1905, its leaders included two men of strongly contrasting character, but the shared aim of an Irish Republic, Michael Collins and Eamon de Valera. Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins really come to national prominence in the aftermath of the 1916 Rising. De Valera very much has his mind focused on the idea of him being the statesman with a strategy. Collins has very different talents and very different aims, and his principal aim, of course, is to render Ireland ungovernable. Unionists who had resisted home rule prior to the war were alarmed by the increasing support for Sinn Féin and its demands for Irish independence. For those in Belfast and the North East, some form of separation of Ulster from the rest of the country was now on their agenda. They were led by two powerful figures, Edward Carson, the charismatic Dublin-born barrister, and Belfast James Craig the son of a wealthy whiskey distiller and an MP who had become a rising star at Westminster. Well, it was a partnership forged, I suppose, in the heat of the home rule dramas before the First World War. The two men complemented each other very well. Carson, of course, was the very strident speaker, the very uh, commanding leader. Uh, James Craig was more of a, a backroom man with the administrative and organisational talents. Uh, but there's no doubt that the two men worked very harmoniously together. But there was a crucial difference between the two leaders. As a Belfast man, James Craig was already looking beyond his Dublin colleagues' all-Ireland approach to unionism. His loyalty was to Ulster. There is a feeling going right back to the beginning of the Home Rule crisis in the greater Belfast area, that partition will come and it's not the worst thing that might happen. Of course we want the whole of Ireland to stay within the Union, but we can live with some form of partition. The business community in particular was inclined to that view and a lot of the people that Craig was closest to were inclined to that view. And that goes back even to the 1880s, the 1890s. As Ireland went to the polls in December 1918, voters had a choice between Sinn Féin and the Irish Parliamentary Party, and between two radically different visions of Ireland's future. Sinn Féin had emerged from the ashes of the GPO and the graves of the 1916 martyrs. It wants to achieve sovereign independence for an all-Ireland republic. And on that platform, and a platform of abstentionism from the British Parliament, and uh, a commitment to establish a Doyle in Dublin, an Irish uh, parliamentary assembly, it sweeps the polls in the 1918 election with 73 of the 105 Irish seats. Just as Sinn Féin enjoyed an election landslide in the South, 
Unionists had a decisive victory in the north. Now these political forces with opposing agendas were consolidating their power bases. Unionism was in a much strengthened state. They now had 23 seats in Ulster. That gave them an overwhelming majority over the 15 or so nationalist and Sinn Féin MPs returned. So, you know, they had their own kind of upsurge to match that of Sinn Féin. One of the big consequences of the 1918 general election is that Ulster unionists do very well. And that has a very similar effect in sort of narrowing down the space for kind of political compromise. We now have a movement which is really centred on Ulster. It's more populist, it's more democratic, but it's also rooted specifically in a sort of a territorial claim. Uh, and that really makes partition um, a lot more likely in terms of the two big uh, outcomes of the 1918 general election. Both unionists and republicans would take advantage of another political force that emerged for the first time in 1918, women. They had become more politically engaged before the war and were voting now for the first time. They included the members of the Ulster Women's Unionist Council. This is Mount Stewart on the shores of Strangford Lock in County Down, home to the Londonderry family. This was a really significant house in both Unionist history and also Tory history. Theresa VI, Marchioness of Londonderry, was renowned as a political hostess. And she, in 1918, was heading up a massive organisation and a powerful organisation, the Ulster Women's Unionist Council. So the biggest political association of women in Ireland's history. So this is Theresa, sixth Marchioness of Londonderry. She's remembered as a very powerful woman and a very strong personality, very determined in her views. She always said she was interested in causes, not people. And one of those key causes was unionism. So what she's doing in 1918 is leading a huge organisation of political women in Ulster and trying to guide them through this new political landscape on how to cast a vote, who to cast a vote for, because the real fear was that women perhaps wouldn't vote or would vote from Theresa's perspective in the wrong direction. In the Republican movement, women find their voice in Come On The Man, a women's council formed in 1914 to advance the cause of Irish independence and in Sinn Féin. Sinn Féin had two candidates. In the south, famously in Dublin, we had Constance Markiewicz, but in, in the north, we had Winifred Carney, who had proven her credentials. She's the first woman to enter the GPO with the forces, and she's very famously known as the typist with a Webley revolver and her typewriter under her arm. Emboldened by their election victory and repudiating Britain's promise of home rule, Sinn Féin took matters into their own hands and formed an independent, though illegal, parliament in Dublin. They withdraw to form their own autonomous parliamentary assembly called the Dáil, which is the Irish for assembly, in Dublin. And the Dáil is rapidly backed by a force who will become known as the IRA. But there's always a kind of submerged split between those who want to proceed by a political route, by political pressures, and those who want to move on into guerrilla war. Most Republicans assumed that the route to Irish self-determination lay through political means. So at the centre of the opening of the Doyle was essentially the Declaration of Independence and a message to free nations, which meant an appeal to the international community for recognition of Irish independence. So that was very much a political strategy. Very few Republicans expected that a guerrilla warfare would become a central part of how that campaign would progress. But Republicans in favour of taking up arms had already done so. On the same day as the Doyle sat in Dublin for the first time, two members of the Royal Irish Constabulary were killed in an IRA ambush in County Tipperary. The first shots of the Irish War of Independence had been fired. Focused on Britain's post-war economy and the peace settlement across Europe, 
Prime Minister Lloyd George was taken by surprise by the speed at which events were developing in Ireland. I don't think Lloyd George knew who he was dealing with. Sinn Féin is much more of a presence and a, an organising force across the empire. Ireland was seen as a precedent for claims of self-rule and indeed independence among other colonial territories. Irish national heroes were claimed as heroes in India. Their names were very well known. They were in the newspapers. So it was impossible to draw a dividing line. Indians were united in demanding greater self-government. Names like Michael Collins and de Valera were being written about, particularly in the vernacular languages. For these nationalists, the Sinn Féiners, uh, the de Valeras and the Michael Collins were their heroes as much as Irish heroes. Although home rule was still in the statute books, with Sinn Féin's separatist agenda threatening political stability and anti-colonialism resurgent across the empire, solving the Irish question had become more urgent than ever before. Lloyd George looked to a former leader of the Irish Unionist Party to find a way forward, establishing a cabinet committee under the direction of Walter Long. Walter Long is charged with the task by Lloyd George to construct a measure of home rule or devolution for Ireland, uh, which honours the British government's responsibilities as laid down in the Home Rule Act of 1914. In appointing somebody like Walter Long, Lloyd George is taking a bow towards his unionist fellow government ministers and letting them know policy in relation to Ireland will be handled by somebody who is a true blue conservative, somebody who's a record with Irish unionism before the war, somebody who's deeply unsympathetic to home rule, let alone um, the more advanced agenda of the new nationalism that's now emerged. The main preoccupation is Ulster. They do not take into account the rise of Sinn Féin and the way that another home rule proposal uh, was, would no longer be adequate. The committee proposed two new jurisdictions with their own parliaments, one in Belfast and one in Dublin. The key shift which the Long Committee produces is that we're now looking at two parliaments and two states. And this is a, a really big decision with a lot of consequences, the idea of setting up a separate Northern Ireland state which will effectively be a unionist state. But Long's proposals also left the door open for a future All-Ireland Parliament. There is also supposed to be a Council of Ireland through which representatives of the North and South will come together. And I think Long's vision was that through this Council of Ireland and through cooperation between the two parts of Ireland, there would eventually just be one parliament in Ireland. But of course, it would still be within the United Kingdom. Crucially and strategically, Long's committee proposed that the new northern state should consist of nine counties, the entire historic province of Ulster. Nine counties because it is the old province of Ulster, but also because that would create a different religious and therefore political balance with a larger nationalist and Catholic presence, some chance demographically or politically of coming together with the rest of the island might be possible in the future. Concerned about having only a small Protestant majority within a nine county state, Ulster Unionists staked their claim for six counties. The Ulster Unionists know that six counties will give them a compact, defensible, built-in majority Protestant Unionist state, and that's what they argue for. It's a political calculation. It's essentially a religious headcount. So within a nine-county definition of Ulster, there would have been 56% um, Protestant. In a six-county definition, it increased by 10% to 66%, and it's those sorts of calculations that were being made. 
Craig's decision to opt for a six-county northern state would be at the expense of Unionists in the excluded Ulster counties of Cavan, Monaghan and Donegal. They would be left outside of the new northern state and outside the United Kingdom. We're standing in the beautiful village of Glasslock in County Monaghan, on the borders of Armagh, Monaghan and Tyrone. Three counties meet here. The consensus was there should be a nine-county entity. But, of course, when this was ran past James Craig, he said Protestant representation would be strengthened and six counties was an area easier to govern than the whole province. So we have this cold pragmatism by James Craig and, of course, the inner council of Ulster Unionism on the acreage question. The reason was very simple. There were too many Catholics and nationalists in the nine counties and Craig wanted that unit which was, was uh, possible to govern with his own parliament, with his own police force. There was an abiding sense of betrayal by the outlying unionists of Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal. You take an area like this, Glasslock was a majority Protestant area. People here were heavily involved in Orangism and Unionism and suddenly they were being excluded. The feeling of the three county unionists after 1920 in the wake of this betrayal was one of total abandonment. Men, they felt betrayed and dishonoured in the words of one of their spokesmen. The sense of betrayal felt by border unionists was mirrored by northern nationalists who feared being trapped in a unionist dominated state. The idea of a separate northern state, effectively a unionist political state being created is, is Northern Nationalist's worst nightmare. And the Northern Nationalist response was to boycott it, to turn away from it. And it really sets the pattern of the future that the Northern Irish state will be seen as a state in which Ulster Unionist power is very much consolidated. Finally, on the 22nd of December 1919, Lloyd George introduced his attempt to solve the Irish question one that had defied generations of British Prime Ministers. Shaped by Walter Long's proposals, the Government of Ireland Bill was the blueprint for partition. In December 1919, Lloyd George stands up in the House of Commons and makes this very momentous speech that he has finally found an answer to the Irish question, what he calls it, an old family quarrel. And there he basically lays out the fundamentals of what will be the Government of Ireland Act. This idea of having two devolved administrations, one in Dublin, uh, one in Belfast, with this all-Ireland embryonic government in the shape of a Council of Ireland. And it's typical Lloyd George, you know, it's wonderfully delivered and there's lots of uh, bombast and lots of big phrases. The problem comes, if you read further on in this speech, is when people start to ask him questions about the detail. It's very alarming that there are no maps or detailed plans in terms of exactly what this board is going to look like. You can see the origins of the plan, but in terms of detail, it's woefully ill thought out and is storing up now massive problems for the future, which are gonna just explode. As Lloyd George unveiled his bill in Dublin, Sinn Féin's Minister for Finance was making plans of his own. Michael Collins was also Director of Intelligence for the IRA and about to escalate his guerrilla war against the British administration in Ireland. This isn't just about the IRA taking on Crown forces in Ireland. There are a number of different battles going on within the overall war of independence. And obviously there was much more likely to be attention given to the Irish question if the IRA was going to engage in what they would call spectaculars. Assassinating a Lord Lieutenant or managing to take out British intelligence agents in Ireland, well, that again would have been regarded as a significant success for the IRA, but it was always a very high risk strategy. But this strategy is what the IRA pursued, including an attempted assassination of Lord French the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland in Dublin's Phoenix Park. 
to assassinate the representative of the King in Ireland would have sent a very strong message to the British government and internationally about the seriousness of the Irish campaign. He was travelling into the Phoenix Park and uh, a number of volunteers lay in wait for him, but the ambush didn't come off and they didn't manage to reach their target. But the fact that they were planning to do it was a sign of the ambition and the extent to which this military campaign for independence had really moved up a serious step. The IRA does escalate its campaign, so things become much more intense and bloody. David Lloyd George and his cabinet are forced uh, to come back to the Irish question because of the very escalation. As violence intensified in the South, the Government of Ireland Bill began its journey through Parliament, an attempt to address radically different political aspirations. It was, in black and white, the plan to partition the island. So this is the Government of Ireland Act 1920. It's the measure which effectively institutes partition on the island of Ireland. Lord George is nothing if not a dealer in political realities. I think he understands very clearly the political challenges that he's up against. And to some extent, the legislation reflects this. The legislation reflects uh, a desire to address uh, Ulster Unionism and Ulster Unionism's Tory allies. The provisions for the 26 counties of Southern Ireland, as defined by the bill, are judged by the condition of Irish nationalism in 1920, wholly inadequate. I think there was probably an air of unreality about Lloyd George's plan. Even in the House of Commons, people are quite skeptical um, as to how viable the plan is and how realistic it will be and, and did, how much political support there is on either side of this new Irish border for this settlement. The big problem with the Government of Ireland Act, of course, is it's really answering a question from before the war. Because the Sinn Féin demand by this time, remember, is not the demand for um, devolved power. It's about national self-independence is what they're searching for. That's a very different kind of question. Ulster Unionists, who had steadfastly resisted home rule and never wanted partition, had come to accept that a new northern state was the only way to preserve their place in the Union and Empire. What the Government of Ireland Act gives to the six northeastern counties is what they will have and hold. And James Craig, not a brilliant man, but a very canny politician and a very immovable politician when he needs to be, will make the most of it. From Craig's point of view, this is no longer a second best, the Government of Ireland Act. This allows me to set up my own administration, to have a reliable security forces. So that is something he's desperately determined to get going on what seems to him the only way out. While the IRA's campaign of violence had been intensifying in the south of Ireland, the North had remained relatively calm. But that was to change in the summer of 1920. Tensions are clearly rising. And of course, in that year, 1920, PR is introduced for Irish elections. And in the local elections of January and June 1920, nationalism does very well in counties like Fermanagh, Tyrone, the city of Derry. For the first time, Derry has a nationalist Sinn Féin corporation. This had been a Protestant unionist citadel. And suddenly you have um, a nationalist mayor. Following the electoral success of Sinn Féin, violence in the city resulted in 20 deaths and the imposition of martial law. The violence that uh, had engulfed the south of Ireland started to reach Ulster. And there was a genuine fear within Ulster Unionism that was hap what was happening in the south and west of Ireland would also happen in Ulster. So Ulster Unionists started to arm themselves. Among those responding to the IRA activity were the men of the Ulster Volunteer Force, an armed Protestant militia originally formed to resist home rule. Many within its ranks had fought on the Western Front during the First World War. Now they were remobilizing across the north.
The Ulster Volunteer Force before the war was very dominated by the upper classes and its leadership and control. And Loyola's potential paramilitary activity was incredibly well controlled. What happens now is violence and IRA violence has changed the situation. And there is less top-down control of Loyola's violence. And this is the very poisonous mix in which Northern Ireland is set up. The timing of this is particularly terrible because we've got the holiday of the 12th coming up. Unionists are very, very concerned that the old fight has gone out of them, that Sinn Féiners now are organizing within their province, in their midst. There's a lot of concern about the trouble elsewhere in Ireland. And there are examples of IRA activity, cross-border IRA activity. So there is a great deal of tension. And then on the 12th of July, Carson makes quite an inflammatory speech in which he uh, lambasts the British government, really, for, for not treating Ulster the, the way that their loyalty deserved. In the summer, violence swept across towns in East Ulster, then erupted in Belfast's shipyards. The beating heart of an industrial city whose neighborhoods had evolved along sectarian lines through the 19th century. The shipyard historically closed for a fortnight on the 12th of July. It reopens on Monday the 21st of July. 3,000 Catholics are working in the shipyard. And suddenly, parties armed with crowbars and hatchets visit the yard after several meetings, and all Sinn Féiners are driven out of the yard. In other words, all Catholics, all nationalists. Catholic workers in the shipyards were, were, I guess, an easy target. And as the IRA operations began, there was a fury directed against the isolated Catholic workers workers were forced to jump into Belfast Lock, had rivets thrown at them, and not only them, but also the so-called rotten prods, the men who were seen as being too sympathetic to their Catholic work, fellow worker. One eyewitness in D Street saw these men running for the lads, blood streaming from their faces. And he said there seemed to be nobody in chase, but what had happened must have been so frightful that they were still running as they ran for shelter in the neighboring Catholic area. The violence spread, so you have isolated Catholic communities in East Belfast, in Ballyhackham or Short Strand, who are also feeling the, the brunt of that violence, and, and it escalates from there. This is the spark that lights the fuse for ongoing sectarian violence in the city. As the Catholic workers return to the markets and the falls, bloodied and bruised from this attack, there's a reaction, of course. The IRA become involved. There are attacks on shipyard trams. Some of them are bombed. Workers are, are killed. And, of course, there's a loyalist response. The temperature just soars in terms of sectarian division and uh, animosity. Sectarian tensions workplace tensions, they become particularly potent and particularly magnified from the summer of 1920 onwards. There were gun attacks in Belfast, for example, on the Falls Road, and there were sniper attacks on the Shankill Road. There were examples of bombs, homemade bombs, being thrown onto trams. And so the whole atmosphere was, you didn't know whether people, when they went out, whether they would come back alive. Four days of violence in Belfast left 19 people dead, 11 Catholics and eight Protestants, with hundreds injured. But the violence against Catholic workers in the Belfast shipyards did not go unnoticed in the south, where Sinn Féin supporters initiated a boycott of northern businesses. When you end up with a policy in the shape of the Belfast boycott, it does not come from the top, it actually comes from the bottom. What you have is a number of shopkeepers in the west of Ireland boycott 
goods that originate in Belfast. Belfast Industries did a big distributing trade with the South. Maguire and Patterson's matches, Gallagher's tobacco, Ballyclare paper. And suddenly these travellers were being turned away in Chewham and Ballinasloe and Bandon. Sinn Féin supporters are saying, we don't want you. You drove our fellow countrymen out of the work in Belfast. I mean, it's based, obviously, on a very bigoted view of Northern Unionists, which is how you hurt the average Northern Protestant is by hitting them in their pocket, because that's what they care about, is money. Um, so this idea is that you're going to try and bring them to their knees economically, and that somehow that means they're going to re reinstate the expelled shipyard workers. That's the idea that basically emerges. The rationale behind the Belfast boycott is to force a kind of political change, but actually it, it, it entrenches sectarian tensions, particularly in areas like Monaghan and so on, where there's a lot of boycotts on Protestant or Unionist uh, businesses, and it, it, it really compounds the sense of a, a partition settlement actually taking shape on, on the ground. The violence in Belfast had dissipated by late July, but within a month, sectarian tensions erupted once again. This time, in the town of Lisbon. In 1920, you have the assassination of the Sinn Féin Lord Mayor of Cork, Thomas McCurtain, murdered by unknown uniformed men, but pretty well identified in the coroner's inquest as members of the Royal Irish Constabulary. And of course, the coroner's verdict in Cork points the finger at a number of individuals, but one of them is a DI called Ross Oswald Swansea. And of course, for his own safety, Swansea, who was an Ulsterman, is spirited north to the Unionist town of Lisburn. The fact that he was transferred out of Cork was probably a recognition this was a targeted man and they got him out of there fairly fast. But the Cork IRA did not let that go. The assassination of Swansea was carefully planned at the behest of Michael Collins. He wanted members of the Cork IRA to shadow Swansea and eventually execute Swansea on the street. As he emerges from divine service in Lisburn on that summer Sunday, Swansea is shot several times with McCurtain's gun as he emerges from the cathedral. But of course, the Catholic population of Lisburn pay a terrible price. What the RIC from Lisburn record in the report, a crusade against the entire Catholic population, quote unquote. In the hours that followed, loyalists went on the rampage in the town, looting and burning Catholic homes and businesses. So this is a collection of photographs from John Lanigan, the photographer who captured the scenes in Lisburn in the week or so after um, the Swansea Rats. So this is a scene from Market Square, so the, the area that's surrounding the museum building where we are today. Uh, on this page, we have more scenes from Market Square. These are further down. On the second page here, we have scenes from Bow Street. Um, the ratting, as I say, was indiscriminate, so it went throughout Bow Street, targeting commercial premises, pubs, things like that. So on this page, we have the parochial house, which is just off Longstone Street, um, so the Catholic area. The parochial house is really targeted towards the end of the riots. It's almost a crescendo, and there's talk of um, people dancing around in priests' vestment outside the parochial house as it went up in flames. 300 Catholic families, almost the entire Catholic population of Lisburn, flee. And what it shows is how directly linked the kind of sectarian and communal violence which uh, takes place across a lot of Ulster is with, with the wider uh, war of independence uh, that's taking place in the south. So this is the front page of the Illustrated London News, so a, a national newspaper. And it shows um, a scene from Donaghy's Boot Factory in North Market Square. And it says it's a scene suggestive of Eeps or Ras town near Belfast. So it's comparing Lisbon with the burnt out shell of um, villages and towns in, in war-torn Belgium. I think it reflects just how intense the war of independence is becoming that, you know, quiet towns like Lisbon can suddenly become like bombed out towns in Belgium. Meanwhile, Lloyd George and his government were struggling to contain the IRA's guerrilla campaign in the south of Ireland. 
with the Royal Irish Constabulary under siege and reluctant to deploy more regular soldiers, he turned to Winston Churchill, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, who had already devised a counter-insurgency strategy to fight the IRA. Lloyd George and Churchill became increasingly aggressive themselves. To use Lloyd George's phrase, they would grab murder by the throat. And Churchill was particularly belligerent. He was also responsible for the, the establishment of this quasi-military force, the Black and Tans, and the auxiliaries. The Black and Tans were a force of mostly ex-military men who were there really to suppress anything in the way of insurrection, and the auxiliaries um, assisted them in that. It became a ghastly kind of bloodbath. But the deployment of the Black and Tans was to backfire as their reputation for brutality and reprisal attacks on civilians and property intensified the conflict in the South, leading to international condemnation. There's a much more visible enemy now in the form of the Tans and the Auxiliaries, the Auxiliaries driving around the country in their crossly tenders, and these mobile IRA guerrilla units laying ambushes for them in various parts of the country. So the, the guerrilla war, the death toll, the number of uh, set-piece engagements between the IRA and the Crown forces increases quite significantly in 1920. Lloyd George's hopes of suppressing insurrection were dealt a heavy blow by the assassination in one day of 14 British agents in Dublin. The operation was masterminded by Michael Collins and carried out by members of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, known as the Squad. On that morning, Collins's squad raided the houses where 12 or 13 of these men were living around suburban Dublin and shot them dead in their homes. Bloody Sunday in November 1920 made a mockery of David Lloyd George's assertion that he had murder by the throat. The damage that was inflicted on the intelligence service, on the reputation of, of Britain, uh, it was an embarrassment. The response to the killings of British intelligence agents involved the slaughter of civilians at a football game in Croke Park. It caused revulsion nationally and internationally. There were embarrassing headlines once again going around the world. But the end of 1920, November 1920, does begin to focus minds in a different way. Could there be a way out of this? With no let up in the violence, Lloyd George realized that negotiations with Sinn Féin were inevitable. But in Belfast, Unionist leader James Craig was wary of the British government and suspicious of any potential talks. Craig is uh, very, very apprehensive indeed. He has no trust of Lloyd George whatsoever, and he is keenly aware that the direction of these talks may end up as being extremely threatening to the partition settlement which he has uh, uh, just overseen. Eager to secure partition and defend the emerging Northern Ireland state, James Craig's priority became the creation of a new police force. The new Northern Ireland statelet needed euphemistically called peacekeeping facilities. And there was, of course, the old template of the Ulster Volunteer Force, the UVF. But this, over the next two years, would devolve into something else. They were now being seen more as a special constabulary. The establishment of the Ulster Special Constabulary is partly about the need to control territory and to prevent kind of Republican incursions. And the USC are very successful as a counter-insurrectionary force. There's a massive mobilization. There's a huge force of 30,000 men are created. It effectively prevents the IRA from uh, fighting an effective guerrilla war. But the consequences are very significant in terms of, right from the outset, 
alienating Northern Catholics and also in creating a sense that the way in which law and order and actually the, the, the power of the Unionist state operates is sectarian right from the very uh, beginning. As the infrastructure of a new Northern Ireland was being prepared, there was also a change of Unionist leadership when Dublin-born Edward Carson stepped aside for Ulsterman James Craig in February 1921. Craig is uh, he's an organiser, where Carson is not. Above all, Craig has the linkages in Belfast and in the business and professional communities of Eastern Ulster that Carson simply doesn't have. Carson very much remains an Irish Unionist, and he is concerned about the nature of a Northern Ireland Parliament and will it be a Protestant state, and that's not what he wanted. So he sees partition very much as a defeat. Carson does feel essentially that he has failed. So he's happy to hand things over um, to Craig. Craig is a far more practical person. Craig is a brilliant organiser. If you want someone to build a state for you, you have to ask someone like James Craig. He can definitely get everything working and functioning. But, you know, James Craig's not going to write much poetry. I think it's very difficult for Craig, who was always the second in command, the person who had the flair for organisation now has to step up and be the leader in incredibly difficult circumstances. Within weeks of becoming Unionist leader, James Craig was persuaded to help Lloyd George find a way out of the conflict in the south of Ireland. Lloyd George has been using various emissaries to talk to Sinn Féin. His eye lights on Craig. I mean, if he could get the Ulsterman to converse with Eamon de Valera, at length that a secret setting in Dublin things might work. Craig agrees, he's a man of courage. He agrees to go to Dublin, he stays overnight with the Viceroy at the Phoenix Park, and he's picked up by a car full of IRA men, and eventually after a circuitous journey, brought to a suburban residence where he meets the Longfellow, Eamon de Valera. The risk that Craig takes when he goes to Dublin, unarmed, alone, escorted by people he had no reason to trust for a meeting with de Valera. It's a very, very important meeting because it's the first breakthrough. The war is still going on. It's the first time that jaw jaw seems to be winning out over war war. Craig was much attacked in the north by his right wing for, you know, toadying to the man of blood, de Valera whereas de Valera was able to pass it over as talking to the leader of the minority in Ireland. All sorts of rumours were flying around that uh, Craig was actually going down to Dublin to ask de Valera to be the Prime Minister in the United Ireland and so on. That kind of reflected the highly nervous uh, condition, I think, of, of the people in Ulster at this time. Here you have Craig representing the intransigence of Ulster Unionism, Craig, the architect of partition. And yet here you have Eamon de Valera, who said he joined the Irish Volunteers in 1913 to prevent partition. The president of the Republic in popular parlance, you know. And here they are face to face. The meeting itself is a very, very bizarre one, and, and James Craig's recollections of this are quite interesting. He sits down with de Valera, who he says then proceeds to basically lecture him on Irish history. De Valera gave him a lot of history and a little economics. And suddenly, a, a lovely Kerry blue dog entered the room, which both men were able to pet, and they agreed to a form of words. Craig himself just ends up tearing off a piece of paper and writing some ambiguous statement about how, how both of them had constructive discussions and so on. There is just no chemistry at all between the two men. After the inconclusive meeting between de Valera and Craig, in May 1921, voters North and South prepared to go to the polls once again, as set out in the Government of Ireland Act this was the election that would finally deliver two parliaments in Ireland. The election in 1921, the first election to the Northern Ireland Parliament, resulted in a resounding victory for the Unionist Party. They won 40 out of 52 seats. 
there were 12 seats split evenly between the old Irish Parliamentary Party and Sinn Féin, but they refused to take their seats in the Northern Parliament, the new Northern Parliament. So the Unionists, in a sense, had it to themselves to, to shape uh, what was going to happen in the new state. With landslide victories for Unionism in Ulster and Sinn Féin in the rest of Ireland, the division between North and South could not have been more stark. And despite the war of independence raging across the island, Unionists in the North continued to lay the foundations for a new state. The creation of the Northern Ireland state represented security. We are here, we are permanent, and Craig and his Unionist colleagues believe that this is a final settlement. I think for Craig, the first and most important challenge, and the challenge that will always be there, is survival. He wants this state to survive and to be secure. We're looking at film of the sitting of the Northern Ireland Parliament in Union College building at the top of Botanic Avenue. This was the UK's first example of devolved government. And in many ways, it's quite a remarkable achievement that this was done so quickly. Well, urgency is vital to Craig. The reason is he is determined to show that Northern Ireland, the Northern Ireland Parliament, is up and running as a going concern. From the point of view of Craig and others, this was not an ideal settlement. They'd had to surrender the interests of Unionists all over the island, but he was not going to concede any further ground. This is how he saw it. The essential point for Craig is this. I am making the best of a bad job here. Now, your side of the bargain is, in London, is to support me in trying to get Belfast up and running again as a normal city. The Government of Ireland Act had created two states in Ireland, but had it solved the Irish question? With IRA violence continuing across the island, Unionists found themselves in control of a state they hadn't wanted just a decade earlier, one that Northern nationalists wanted no part of. What we have, we hold, was the message from James Craig and his government. But could they succeed? and what would be the impact on generations to come. The underlying aim of the King's speech was to emphasize reconciliation. This is the opening gambit, really, to offer Ireland a place in the British Commonwealth of Nations. The Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed under threat of immediate and terrible war. Craig was apoplectic with anger when he read the terms of the treaty. The Northern State isn't functioning. And, you know, the British are seriously considering perhaps renegotiating the whole basis of partition. 